everyone and today we're going to discuss about strong and difference which I have already discussed before and uh, about the anion gap. <clears throat> now it will be very easy if we could actually have the acid base disturbances described in this simple way. <clears throat> So if there is a primary respiratory disorder, there is chemical buffering, there is a primary metabolic disorder, there is chemical buffering. And uh, from primary respiratory disorder, there is compensation is renal because a respiratory system cannot compensate for its own disorders, uh, which are a bit slow, can take almost two to five days at times. Uh, whereas for primary metabolic disorders, uh, compensation is rapid and occurs because of the respiratory system. So if you become acidotic, the respiratory rate will go up, uh, you wash out the CO2. Uh, if you are alkalotic, uh, respiratory rate will go down and uh, you will start retaining CO2 and uh, form uh, hydrogen ions and bicarb ions. Hydrogen ions will try to uh, you know, balance out uh, the alkalosis. But then life is not that simple. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the methods of uh, describing the acid base balance uh, uses the Stewart's method, and this is about strong ion difference. And this is uh, very simple to explain by knowing uh, what are these strong ions and weak ions. So, if you look at the compounds, there are uh, divided into electrolytes which dissociate easily and non-electrolytes non that do not dissociate and uh, these are the ones which contribute to the osmolarity. Uh, so electrolytes that dissociate can be then classified into strong ions and uh, strong ions then can be further classified into strong cations so these have a positive charge and strong anions uh, that have a negative charge. And then we also have some weak ions, which then can be classified to volatile acids, uh, which are described last time, which is many uh, carbon dioxide, and non-volatile acids, uh, which are basically albumin and phosphates. So these strong ions, um, uh, these are the ones which are dissociated easily, uh, can be described uh, uh, through a gamble gram. So described by gamble, so that's why it's called a gamble gram. So basically the strong ion difference is a difference between the cations and the anions. So the cations like sodium, uh, which is a main cation, which we measure, uh, potassium, which is very small in amounts in the extracellular fluid. It's mainly a intracellular cation. And then calcium and magnesium, which are also uh, present in very small amounts. The anions which are of most important are the chloride and lactates. And uh, so the decrease in the strong ion difference indicates acidosis. Um, this happens because uh, uh, the strong ions uh, will squeeze uh, the bicarb and uh, thus reduce it. So this can be actually seen um, in this gamble gram. So let's look at the left side uh, where we have the cations, which is mainly sodium. And then we have the uh, anions. Uh, the chloride, uh, we have the bicarb, and uh, then we have albumin and lactates. Now, uh, assuming uh, electron neutrality, and that is uh, what it's all about, uh, the gamble grams demonstrates uh, that the ions that fill the strong ion difference uh, uh, between the strong cations and anions are primarily bicarbs and weak acids like albumin. Okay, so these can be actually affected by strong ion difference. So if, like we said, that there is decrease in the strong ion difference, uh, there is acidosis, and that occurs because that leads to reduction in the bicarb levels. So the weak acids, uh, which are uh, principally albumin and phosphate, and uh, they uh, they dissociate partially, and uh, so they're not really strong ions. But they are good buffers, okay, albumin has got lots of negative charges, uh, so okay, it can hold um, uh, lots of these uh, cations, you know, like hydrogen ion is a cation, so they can hold, so they are actually good buffers. 
so this again uh, decrease in the strong iron difference uh, leads to increased total uh, weak acid concentration and then can lead to acidosis. Uh, whereas in the uh, increase in the strong iron difference decreases total weak acid concentration and that leads to alkalosis. <clears throat> so the principal element of the strong iron difference are basically the sodium and the chloride. Isn't it? So normal difference uh, is basically around 35 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, we know that sodium is around 40, 140 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, chlorides are 105 and the difference around 35 milliequivalents per liter. So that is the strong ion difference. So just knowing the sodium levels and chloride levels uh, give us the idea of the strong ion difference. So uh, the measured sodium uh, minus the measured chloride minus 35 uh, should be equal to zero. So for equal, uh, so every one in me, uh, milliequivalent per liter change in the sodium uh, minus the chloride difference the base axis will change by one uh, milliequivalent in negative direction. So for example, a reduction in sodium uh, can cause acidosis because there is relative increase in the chloride ions. And uh, it can happen vice versa. So in the uh, case of hypernatremia, that can lead to alkalosis uh, because there is a relative decrease in the chlorides. So, uh, this is uh, just another example. So if say for example hyponatremia the sodium levels are 120 and uh, then the sodium minus chloride uh, base axis uh, effect uh, can be measured as uh, the measured sodium minus measured chloride minus 35. So uh, 120 minus 105 that is assuming the chlorides are normal minus 35 that's is equal to 15 minus 35 that's equal to minus 20. So it's a negative strong ion difference that indicates there is acidosis. So there is relative hyperchloremia despite normal uh, chlorides in this situation. Okay. So what's the effect of the lactate? So lactate we know is generated uh, from anaerobic metabolism. So apart from the chloride, it is the other strong uh, anion uh, which is present. So in the gamble gram, you can look at it, it's present on the right side, okay. So lactic base axis effect is taken as one minus uh, measured lactate. And so uh, the normal lactate levels, anything about two is considered as normal. So when lactate increases, so one minus, uh, say if the lactate has gone up to five, you get uh, the difference is uh, minus four. Uh, so it makes the uh, strong ion difference negative. So because it's making, making it negative, that means there is going to be acidosis. So the other uh, weak uh, acid, which I have already uh, described was albumin. Okay, so uh, what is the effect of albumin on the, um, the strong ion difference? So if you look at the effect of the albumin, this can be described as uh, one fourth of the albumin concentration in gram per liter. So uh, if you look at the normal albumin levels, that is around 42 grams per liter, uh, then the ionic concentration difference on the base axis is one fourth of 42, that comes to around 10.5 uh, milliequivalents per liter, so approximately 10. So the acid base effect of albumin changes uh, can be calculated uh, from the difference between the reference value and the ionic concentration corresponding to the patient's albumin level. So at this I will go a little bit more in details and uh, so the effect like I've said uh, so you have to know what is the normal concept that's probably to be already know and then you look at the measured albumin what is the lab value of albumin and you look at the one for the so for every 10 gram uh, decrease in the plasma albumin the base axis will increase by 2.5 so makes the maze, uh, may, uh, makes the patient more alkalotic. So if albumin drops uh, to 22, then the base axis is uh, one fourth of the 42 minus 22. So that is a uh, uh, difference of 20. So the albumin has dropped by around 20. Uh, so one fourth of that is around five. So like I said, uh, for every 10 grams, it reduces by 2.5. So 2.5 times two, that is around, around plus five, okay. So base axis has actually gone up to plus five, so it is making it uh, more alkalotic. Okay. And so the, if you look at the total effects of base uh, 
uh, axis and other ions. Then base axis is the sodium minus the chloride effect. So this is easy to see. So we can actually get the sodium and chloride levels measured uh, from the labs. Uh, then you need to look at the lactic effect and I've uh, uh, mentioned about that, that how it is one minus lactate level. Album, albumin effect, it is uh, one fourth of the, uh, the standard albumin, which is around 42 minus and uh, the measured albumin and the other uh, effects. Okay. So uh, here, if you look at it, if you put some values to that, the uh, so we have the sodium minus chloride minus 35, uh, because 35 is a normal difference between the uh, standard sodium levels and chloride levels. And the one minus lactate is the lactate effects and one fourth of the 42 minus the measured albumin uh, plus for the other ions. So uh, the first one is, uh, uh, say, for example, in, our, in the uh, example I have uh, before, you know, uh, described where we have the sodium uh, difference of 10 uh, between sodium and uh, the due to lactate, it was 5 and albumin of 22. Uh, then we have the base axis is minus 20, minus 4, plus 5. And that comes to minus 20 plus 9, that is minus 11. Now assume that uh, from the uh, blood gas, uh, you know, we have done on the patient, uh, the measured um, base axis is minus 8. In that case, the difference we have uh, from the uh, what has been measured and the one we have calculated, we have calculated that this patient should actually have a base deficit of minus 11. Uh, but here, what we actually are seeing that the uh, measured base deficit from the blood gas was minus eight, the calculate is minus 11, and that actually comes to plus three. That means there are some other ions. And this is quite possible that this could be maybe from the, from say magnesium levels, uh, calcium levels or other uh, cations. Uh, so the other ions can be now be calculated if we know what is the measured uh, base axis and also from the uh, what uh, we have uh, calculated uh, from the sodium chloride effect, from the lactate effect and from the albumin effect. So albumin uh, need to be measured from the labs. So these are actually very, very useful. So if you look at the uh, simplified steward approach, it basically says that the base axis is equal to sodium levels from the lab minus chloride levels from the lab minus 35. Or you can say that uh, this, this is what the sodium chloride difference is. Then uh, from the lactate effect is one minus the lactate. And from the albumin, it is uh, one fourth of the normal albumin minus the measured albumin uh, plus the other ions. So if you are measuring the calcium, the magnesium, you can always add that to the uh, base axis and then you can actually also see what your uh, blood gases uh, actually show. So this is a simplified uh, the approach. So looking at the anion gap. So anion gap also seems to be similar to Stewart uh, approach, you know, looking at uh, the strong ion difference. And both of these, uh, you know, approaches, they look at a uh, law of electroneutrality. It's saying that the number of cations that is a plus ions and the negative ions should always match. Okay. And they should actually difference should be zero. But if there is a difference, that means there is something else present. Okay. That is what the anion gap uh, actually means. So this are actually anion gap is very useful in initial evaluation of uh, metabolic acidosis. So coming to the law of electron neutrality or uh, the law of uh, conservation of mass. So total serum cations should always be equal to total serum, serum anions. So uh, cations like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium uh, should be equal to the bicarb, chloride, phosphate, sulfates, uh, proteins which are organic, uh, the negatively charged like albumin or organic acid ions, okay, which are also negatively charged. But in real life, what we actually measure is only uh, some of the cations and some of the anions. So the main cation which is measured is sodium. Okay. And so there are some other unmeasured cations which are actually present, but these are in a very small amount. And the uh, other, uh, the major uh, anions, like I said, is uh, bicarb and chlorides, but there are minor ions like the phosphate, the sulfates, the 
negatively charged proteins or organic acids. These are uh, unmeasured anions. And these are the ones we likely account for mainly for the anion gap. So normal, uh, the, uh, your anion gap is uh, equal to the unmeasured ions, anions minus the unmeasured cations. Uh, but when we're also looking at uh, the anion gap, we're also looking at the cations, that is the mainly sodium uh, minus the anions, uh, which are uh, basically bicarbs and chlorides. Okay. Uh, so, when we look at uh, this is a nice way of depicting uh, what would lead to a wide or a high anion gap. So, first thing is looking at the uh, actual difference of the sodium uh, plus potassium, that is the cation minus the chlorides and bicarbs, whether the anions. Also, we can look at the unmeasured anions and the unmeasured cations. So, uh, if you want to actually see a high ion gap or if you see an ion gap, it, it's quite possible that it could be uh, because of increase in the measured cations. So in uh, hyperkalemia, okay, which can happen, for example, in uh, renal failure, uh, hypernatremia, which is not uncommon either. Uh, so uh, this, these are, uh, are there. Or it could be reduction in the uh, chloride or bicarbonate. So uh, if there is actually, say, patient has been... Uh, losing loss of bicarbs, a uh, patient has got abdominal drains, uh, pancreatic fistula, or uh, there is loss through the urine of bicarbs. So this will also increase the uh, anion gap. But there can also be uh, increase in the uh, measured anions, okay, and uh, or uh, decrease in the unmeasured cations. These can also uh, lead to a wide or high anion gap, and we like going to look into that. So it's very difficult to otherwise think. So we can one way of looking like we looked at the gamble gram. I try to look at different ways of uh, looking. How can we explain this anion gap? So now we have the cations, sodium and potassium on one side, and then we have the chlorides and the bicarbs on the other side. So uh, if we actually move the balance and the uh, sodium and potassium uh, will be actually be heavier and they actually are moved and uh, the chloride and bicarbs higher up. And this is what has led to the anion. This is because of the uh, some of the unmeasured anions. But uh, what we are actually trying to see is that it is not just a simple this thing. If you add uh, some more un uh, unmeasured anions, it does not equalize the gap. It actually increases the gap. This is because they are like pushing it up with like from a spring. Okay, it's like a spring. So when you have increased and measured and added, added, then it will actually increase the gap. It won't decrease it. And uh, if we actually measure uh, on a cations, then that's easy because uh, they just drop uh, the left side of the scale and the whole thing moves up. So the green part is added to the uh, the anion. So anion gap will increase uh, when you have uh, more unmeasured cations added to the you know already measured anions. Uh, sorry for the cations. Okay. Uh, so the concentration on measured ions, like mainly we're looking at phosphate and sulfates, and uh, this is very very small. So on average, only two to three milliequivalents per liter. Um, so there has to be something else added up or happening uh, within the system uh, to an ion gap to actually increase uh, markedly. Okay. So in real life, the anion gap is just measured by measuring the sodium, the bicarbonate, and the chloride. And on average, this gap is anywhere between uh, 6 to 12 uh, millimoles per liter, or you can actually say 12 plus or minus 4 millimoles per liter. Now, if the anion gap actually increases, then usually you would actually see the squeezing of the bicarbs, okay, so because they actually uh, are the main, uh, uh, you know, the, like a buffers, uh, you can actually see it. So uh, when acids, uh, the, say for example, hydrogen increase, they will combine with the bicarb, isn't it? So they'll form carbonic acid, and this will dissociate into water and carbon dioxide, and you will breathe out the extra amount of carbon dioxide. So the buffering, initial buffering, which actually happens uh, in the extracellular fluid is going to be from the bicarbs. And um, assuming the chlorides are going to remain normal, uh, but this doesn't actually happen. So 
uh, a wide or high ion gap is diagnosed with the assurance uh, when the anion gap is more than 17 to 18 milligrams per liter. So that's one of the first thing. So uh, the uh, things that can actually lead to increase in the anion gap, uh, this can be the abnormal endogenous generation of anions. So this can happen in lactic acidosis like hypoperfusion, uh, type 1 lactic acidosis. Uh, it can also happen in type 2 lactate, where it's deranged uh, carbohydrate metabolism. It can happen because of ketoacidosis, which can be from diabetes, so you know from the uh, history itself. Uh, it can also happen in uh, alcoholic ketoacidosis and uh, also in starvation ketoacidosis. They are also, these are increased amount of anion generated. It can happen because of uh, renal failure, acidosis where there is uremia or acute renal failure. It can occur because of ingestion of exogenous toxins and drugs uh, like methanol, ethylene glycol or salicylate. So there, there are different mnemonics actually used by people to uh, look at the high ion gap. Uh, that used to be mud piles and, uh, and there is also uh, uh, other one which I will actually talk in a minute. Now, looking at the effect of what happens if there is a hypoalbuminemia. Uh, so what does it do to the base axis? Okay, uh, we have actually already discussed this uh, in the Stewart's, uh, you know, method uh, of the, uh, you know, where they're looking at strong ion gap. So even though this is a weak acid, but it is a good buffer because it's got lots of negative charges. And because it's got negative charges and hydrogen ions are positively charged or cations are positively charged, it can actually attract a lot of these. And so it becomes a very good uh, buffer. And like I have explained that uh, the albumin base X is measured as one fourth of the normal uh, albumin level, which is 42 minus the measured albumin level. And so every for every 10 gram decrease in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the albumin level uh, base excess increases by 2.4 and that becomes a more alkalotic so uh, this is just a, a example i think this is again uh, been repeated uh, here how uh, the uh, plasma ion, ion gap actually uh, lowers okay so base axis uh, is increased and uh, but the anion gap is incre uh, increased so in terms of anion gap it says uh, um, that um, the when the albumin is actually uh, uh, you know uh, reduced, the anion gap is also reduced. Okay, so uh, here uh, what the difference is that for every 10 gram of uh, albumin drop uh, below normal, uh, plasma anion gap uh, is lowered by four uh, millimole for liter. So it's easy to actually uh, you know understand that or to remember that. So Low albumin uh, lead to lower anion gap. Okay, so as simple as that. Okay. Uh, so uh, if we actually uh, look at this, this is uh, another place um, uh, where uh, we can actually uh, see a, a positive effect. Okay. So uh, uh, we have got metabolic alkalosis, and um, uh, normally you wouldn't expect the anion gap, high anion gap because high ion, anion gap is normally associated with metabolic acidosis. But if there is actually contraction of extracellular fluid volume, so that for example, there's dehydration, then the uh, albumin concentration actually relatively increases. So the, as the uh, albumin concentration increases, uh, so does the anion gap, okay. So for every 10 gram increase in the albumin, uh, above normal, uh, plasma, uh, you know, anion gap will increase by four millimoles per liter. So, uh, when there is dehydration, there is contraction of volume, and uh, the albumin levels uh, relatively go up. Okay, they are not actually going on in uh, as such, but they are just relatively because the whole volume is contracted. So you can actually still find a uh, wide or high anion gap in metabolic acidosis uh, when there is a uh, you know, uh, contraction of. So, uh, in metabolic acidosis, if you, uh, sorry, alkalosis, if you see high anion gap, 
uh, think think of dehydration. So the treatment there would be a uh, volume expansion, and you will see that with volume expansion, the uh, anion gap will likely normalize. Yeah. Okay. So like I was saying that the a uh, lot of uh, uh, you know mnemonics for the high anion gap, and uh, more recently, uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, the mnemonic uses gold mark. Uh, so G is for glycol, uh, so ethylene and propylene glycol. Uh, o is for oxoproline or pyroglutamic acid, as it's called. As uh, uh, LND are basically LND type lactates. Uh, M is for methanol. A is for aspirin. Uh, R for renal failure. R for rhabdomyolysis and K for ketoacidosis. So these are the uh, common causes for raised anion gap metabolic acidosis. And so it's easy to remember with uh, this mnemonic. Okay, and this is actually looking at uh, the effect of lactic acids and how it can normalize. So uh, you, you on the left side, you actually see a normal ion gap. You got sodium of 140, and uh, you got bicarb of 25, uh, chlorose 103, and then you got the albumin. So albumin is not going to change until, as, like I said, until as there is also a contraction of the extracellular volume. So when lactates are added, say for example, the lactates are plus 10, right? So they will squeeze the bicarb levels. So bicarb levels now are actually from 25 have come down to 15. So the total anion gap has actually increased to now 25. Okay. So there is increase in the anion gap uh, by uh, plus 10. Now, uh, what can happen is that because the, uh, the bicarbs are reduced, uh, there can be in response, there can be hyperchloremia. Okay, so this will compensate uh, for the con contraction of the bicarb level. And this is normally seen in a lot of situations. Uh, and this is to normalize the anion gap. So you can actually still see, so there will be, uh, you know, there is obviously loss of the bicarbs. Uh, because of the lactates, they are being, uh, you know, buffered. The lactates uh, are buffered by the bicarbs. So at the same time, the chlorides, the chlorides are absorbed. Okay, so in the in the kidneys, the kidney tends to actually conserve the chlorides, and you will actually see increase in the uh, chloride levels uh, on the blood gas as machines to actually see that. So uh, even if you actually see a normal pH, normal anion cap. And you see hypochloremia uh, on the thing. You still need to look at is there actually increase in the lactates. Uh, so always uh, look for lactates. So normal uh, anion gap does not mean that there is no uh, acidosis, uh, lactic acidosis present. Uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, easy way of actually looking at uh, the metabolic acidosis. So uh, hypoalpinemia uh, and lactic acidosis. You can still actually have, uh, you know, normal. So you can actually have like this unmasking uh, can happen. So we know that uh, low albumin causes low anion gap, and in lactic acidosis, uh, uh, if there is uh, so lactic in the presence of se severe hypoalbuminemia, can, which can happen in a condition like uh, nephrotic syndrome or cirrhosis. Uh, where, so you expect a wide anion gap in lactic acidosis, uh, but because of the uh, hypoalbuminemia, which has actually now lowered the anion gap, you can actually see normalization. So uh, always look at albumin levels as well uh, when you're looking at the lactic acidosis or uh, in case of severe, severe hypoalbuminemia, uh, don't get, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> think that oh, everything looks normal. No, they can be masking uh, of the anion gap can actually happen, uh, uh, even in the presence of lactic acidosis. So there is a term called uh, corrected anion gap uh, or AGC, and uh, this is where I try to actually look at the albumin and phosphates. So the corrected anion gap is not just uh, the difference uh, between the sodium uh, and uh, the negative ions like chloride and bicarb, uh, but it also takes into account the albumin and phosphate uh, uh, levels and the lactate. So the uh, correct anion gap is equal to sodium and potassium. So here we again in cations we are also adding the uh, potassium, 
because this becomes important, especially in conditions like uh, renal failure, um, where it might actually increase. Uh, minus the chloride and the bicarb, so that is the normal anion gap. And then minus two times the albumin level in gram per deciliter, plus 0.5 times the phosphate in milligram per liter, or 1.5 times the phosphate in if the phosphate has been measured in millimoles per liter and minus the lactate level. So this is called the uh, adjusted or corrected uh, anion gap. Okay. So it's important to actually know that. So uh, when anion gap is more than 30 millimoles per liter, uh, metabolic acid is almost invariably present. Okay. Uh, if it is between 20 and 29, then almost two third of the uh, cases, you can assume that metabolic acidosis is, is present. So it's a usual, uh, a way of looking at uh, metabolic acidosis. So uh, uh, anion gap is wide uh, in uh, uh, some of the etiologies of uh, metabolic acidosis, like we always uh, looked at gold mark, uh, but it may not be in others. Okay. So uh, wide or high anion gap helps to narrow down the differential diagnosis uh, by eliminating the causes of normal anion gap, metabolic acidosis or NAGMA. Uh, so high anion gap or HAGMA or uh, wide anion gap VAGMA, uh, these uh, are actually easy to understand. So how can you actually have normal anion gap in metabolic acidosis? So what is NAGMA? We're going to look into this now. Okay. So normal anion gap acidosis is not uncommon. So the, when there is loss of uh, bicarb, uh, they can be compensatory increase in the chloride level like I explained. And because of that, there is normalization can happen. This is actually seen, uh, for example, if there is diarrhea, uh, urethral diversions, or biliary or pancreatic fistulas, uh, where there is a loss of bicarb. Uh, this is compensated by the increasing chloride. It can also happen in real, uh, a renal condition like type 2 or proximal uh, renal tubular acidosis. Now, in the, uh, in the kidneys, uh, bicarbs are mostly, 90% of the bicarbs, are absorbed in the proximal tubular uh, tubules and 10% are uh, in the DCT. Uh, so uh, in that situation, if there is losses uh, of the bicarb increased losses, there's no reabsorption of the uh, uh, you know, bicarbs. Uh, then uh, there is also uh, what you call the chloride absorption remains, okay, because occurs uh, later on uh, in, the, in the distal tubules. Uh, so the chlorides will be conserved and this will try to actually compensate for the loss of bicarbs. It can happen in certain kind of uh, you know, or, uh, intoxications like with toluene or in uh, with certain uh, medications like topiramate or uh, you know, carbon, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamides. So these all will lead to loss of bicarbs, but and there is uh, compensatory hypercholinemia. Uh, so this uh, normalization of the anion gap. Okay. Then um, there can be uh, decreased uh, renal acid uh, excretion. Uh, so this happens in uh, early uremic acidosis. Uh, type 1 renal acidosis, uh, uh, say due to, uh, uh, you know, amphotericin or lithium or Zorgan syndrome and uh, type 4 renal tubular acidosis which happened due to hypoaldosteronism or pseudo hypoaldosteronism so in these uh, cases as well there is a decreased uh, renal excretion uh, occurs of bicarb and uh, because of the uh, uh, decreased uh, excretion of bicarbs the anion gap because it says it's because between the cations and anions and bicarbs not form the normal uh, anions. So uh, uh, there is reduction in the actually uh, um, the anion gap. So the other causes uh, where there can be still be acidosis but normal uh, uh, anion gap is uh, like in patients uh, uh, we have uh, fluid resuscitation with normal saline. Uh, so this causes increase in the uh, uh, hyper, um, you know, there is chloride levels are increased or so there is hypochloremia. Uh, but at the same time, and uh, the this is reducing the anion gap. Uh, same thing can happen uh, with uh, the uh, you know the uh, anionic uh, uh, amino acids uh, pre containing uh, uh, the 
you know, antral nutrition, so hyperalimentation, uh, where there is increased amount in lysine, histidine, arginine, hydrochloride. These are all negatively charged, uh, you know, amino acids. Or if there is administration of hydrochloride or ammonium chloride, uh, and then other agents uh, sometimes uh, used in treatments so like uh, cholesterolamine, uh, hyperic acid, sulfuric acid. Now these these are normally some of them are are formed as part of the metabolism of amino acids within the. Uh, we rarely would actually see uh, you know hydrochloric acid being administered uh, to patients. Uh, ammonium chloride uh, is used uh, for uh, treatment of uh, alkalosis, and not as normally. But these can Again, these are uh, situations where, uh, even though there is acidosis, there should be expected acidosis, uh, but the anion is, uh, gap is normal. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just uh, showing uh, a, a different way of looking why the, uh, uh, what happens in uh, hypochromic acidosis. So uh, what we're doing, we are actually adding lots and lots of chlorides. And uh, because of this, the chloride, uh, uh, load is increasing, but this is compressing. There is increased losses, especially in the kidneys. So reabsorption of bicarbs is reduced. So the amount of bicarb levels uh, it goes down, and this in uh, hypochromic acidosis. So, and this is a, a nice way of actually looking uh, at the anion gap and the changes that happen with uh, uh, patients where they get uh, normal saline for. Uh, treatment of for as, as a fluid resuscitation. There are situations where you can actually see negative uh, or low anion gap, okay, and uh, this uh, can be caused uh, by uh, hyperchloremia, uh, which are caused uh, by high levels of cations, and this can happen in uh, like uh, lithium toxicity, and uh, uh, this is all negative charged. Uh, it can actually happen in a uh, situation where the calcium, there is hypercalcemia or hypermagnesemia. Okay, so these are cations are relatively increased and uh, in compared to the uh, anions. Okay, so uh, they can. Then uh, there are actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, situations of there, they can be uh, pseudo hypochloremia this happens uh, with bromide iodide uh, intoxication that's because uh, when you actually measure the chloride and uh, the uh, you know the labs they detect this uh, iodide and bromides at, uh, chlo as chlorine uh, so uh, that's why you can actually get uh, uh, pseudo increase in the hypochloromic uh, acids and this would uh, narrow the gap between the cations and uh, anions so you can actually have a, a false uh, uh, you know, falsely low or negative anion gap. Uh, but so when you get that, uh, always look for, uh, uh, you know, other causes. So is there, um, you know, hypercalcemia happening? Is there hypermagnesemia? Uh, is the patient on a certain treatment which can increase the uh, bromide and uh, iodide uh, levels? So you need to actually look at, look at these situations. So if you look at the uh, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis happening from say diarrhea or renal tubular acidosis type 2, there is loss of bicarb. And uh, in this case, the kidney tries to conserve the volume. And uh, this is done by actually conserving the chloride. So uh, because the uh, uh, kidneys are losing uh, negative ions uh, in form of carbo, uh, bicarbs, it will try to conserve it as a, as a uh, chloride. So there will be uh, relative hypochloremia uh, when this situation occurs and this lead to normal ion gap. Now in case of renal dysfunction there are two things. So you are actually getting uh, uh, retention of hydrogen ions because the kidneys are not able to excrete the hydrogen ions. But at the same time there is impaired uh, reabsorption of sulfate which are anions. And so this actually balances out the hydrogen ion retention and uh, this balance leads to a normal anion gap in renal dysfunction. In uh, renal tubular acidosis type 4 and in uh, hyperaldosteronism, uh, there is uh, defective uh, ammonia secretion. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the uh, ammonium and uh, ammonia, uh, these are important uh, for the urine. Uh, the, they are actually, uh, you know, uh, a good buffers uh, in the system. And this leads to the, because there is a defective secretion, then there is alkalization of urine occurs. And uh, uh, 
Uh, so uh, then again, it leads to a normal anion gap uh, metabolic acidosis. So this is just a flow chart of uh, situation when uh, the there is acidosis, uh, but uh, that cannot be detected by the anion. So here, there, then you can actually go back to the strong ion difference, and they might be able to actually explain explain that. So thank you for listening to this lecture and I hope so it is useful. And this will like, again, I will likely uh, try to go through these again when we are talking about uh, rest of the uh, uh, metabolic uh, and uh, respiratory uh, dysfunction, so acid-base imbalances. And, uh, you know, there will be uh, more things like uh, uh, how the compensation occurs. Uh, we will also talk about uh, mixed acid bed balances. And uh, so we're going to talk a lot more uh, about other things. Thank you.